Hello and welcome back. Our next speaker is uh, Michael Watson and he'll talk to us about how to photograph a solar eclipse. Take it away, Michael. Okay, uh, well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back uh, speaking with the Toronto Centre. Last time I was here was um, at the end of last year in December and I talked about having uh, done a solo driving trip to Texas over the course of five days to observe and photograph the annular eclipse of the sun. Uh, and so rumor has it that we have another eclipse of the sun coming up in uh, 32 days. And so I thought that I would uh, have a little discussion about um, photographing solar eclipses. Now, many of you have seen solar eclipses. Uh, some of you will have seen total solar eclipses and you may be very familiar with uh, what I'm going to be talking about, but um, there may be some things that uh, you haven't necessarily experienced yourself or thought about. And so I'm just going to get right to it. It's the um, uh, last presentation of the night and I've got a, a lot of uh, stuff to uh, to show. So let's just start here then uh, with um, with the presentation. And, uh, and so, um, as I say, a lot of this you may uh, know already and you may have uh, experienced. Um, what I would like to do is, um, is mention, and this is, I think, a really uh, important guide, uh, the uh, work by Alan Dyer, who is one of uh, Canada's and indeed the world's greatest astrophotographers, a member of the RESC uh, Edmonton Centre. And uh, this is a book that is available in e-format or PDF, uh, and it gives you really everything that you need to know, uh, and probably more than that. Uh, so that's a very, very good um, resource. So most people in photographing uh, an eclipse of the sun, and I'm talking about now he here either partial or total, because I'm going to be talking about both of them, because not everybody's going to be traveling into the path of totality. Uh, most people are going to be using a, D, uh, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. And so what we're talking about is a 35 millimeter or a cropped uh, frame camera. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about here. And we have to recognize and understand the crop factor. Uh, and so we have here, the, here's a, a diagram of various relative sizes of, uh, of sensors uh, in cameras that are attached to telescopes or lenses. Uh, and we have, for example, if you, uh, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, hope you can. On the left side, we have 1.0. This is a 35 millimeter full frame camera, so-called full frame. Um, they came out several years ago. Before that, the sensors were much smaller and they were so-called crop frames and they have a much smaller field of view. And you see the various sizes of crop frames here, generally about two thirds the size in both dimensions uh, of a full frame camera. And that has a significant effect on the field of view and the apparent size of the eclipse, well, of the sun or the moon or the eclipsed sun uh, when you take your photographs. Uh, and so in order to get the effective um, focal length of your lens, you have to multiply the actual focal length, that is 50 millimeters, wide angle 35 millimeters or 24 millimeters, telephoto 85, 135, 200 as the case may be, by that factor on the left. And so the smaller the size of your sensor in your camera, for example, a crop frame camera, the more you have to multiply it in order to get the effective focal length. So a 50 millimeter lens, for example, becomes something in the order of 80, between 85 and 105 millimeters. In other words, a short telephoto lens. This is a really important uh, aspect to understand about photography, All right? So that's the effective focal length. And so what we see here is then just in relative size, the full frame um, uh, border and the crop frame border. And let me show you, it, it's sometimes uh, not completely understood how small the sun and the moon actually are. They're, they subtend an angle of only half a degree uh, in our sky. And so if you were taking a photograph, for example, of the eclipse sun or just of the moon, or the uh, sun not eclipsed with a solar filter, this is the size that you would get with a 50 millimeter lens. It's really tiny. If you go to a wide angle lens, for example, 35 millimeters, that's what you would get. A 24 super wide angle lens, that would that's what you would get. You have to go to a telephoto lens to get the image size large enough to get any kind of detail, for example, in the corona. And so that's with 135 millimeter lens, 
we go to a 200 millimeter lens. I use a 200 millimeter lens a lot in my astrophotography, including deep sky astrophotography. You go higher up to 500 millimeters. That's the size you're going to get. And so just look at that. If you have a cropped frame camera, um, then just think about the reddish outline there and the size of the eclipse sun. That's what you're going to get with a 500 millimeter lens. With a full frame um, camera, it's obviously going to be much smaller in comparison, although the number of pixels in both dimensions will be greater. Then we go up to a 750 millimeter lens, 1200. This is approximately the focal length that I use for solar eclipses with my um, with my 1253 millimeter uh, Explore Scientific uh, uh, 152 um, millimeter uh, telescope, and you'll see some pictures taken of that. So this gives you an idea of of um, the telephoto lens that you are probably going to need if you're going to be in the path of totality and want to get any detail in the corona and 1600 millimeters and 2000 and so on. Okay, so let's go on. Let's just talk now about solar filters, obviously extremely important. I think that many people, most people may be familiar with this, and that is the Kendrick um, filters. Take a look at what it says in the upper left there. They're not accepting any orders anymore. And anytime you get close to any solar eclipse, the filter manufacturers really sell out. The Kendrick filters are wonderful. I have used them for years. They're really terrific. <clears throat> they are full aperture uh, filters, uh, which go right on the front of the telescope. They're manufactured in different sizes. Uh, and here you can see uh, the Kendrick filter on the front end of my Explorer uh, 6 inch uh, or 152 millimeter uh, f8 refracting telescope which i've used for solar eclipses for a long time and so uh, this is what the sun then looks like through a kendrick solar filter and you may be thinking whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute it's white the sun's yellow no it's not most solar filters actually have color in them this is the actual color of the sun because the, uh, the Kendrick solar filter uh, does not filter out any particular rays of sun. It really is a neutral density filter that filters out the infrared. And so that's what it actually looks like. And you can see there the uh, sunspots and you can get some pretty good detail through a filter such as this. This was at uh, last October's annual eclipse in Texas that I observed. And so um, now this is one thing that's really important. How do you focus in the day, you know, in, in uh, daylight? Well, what I always do is I'm using uh, the, um, the, the filter on the front of my telescope, obviously, put a little hood over my uh, head in order to be able to look at the, um, uh, at the viewing screen on the camera. And then I focus on the sunspots or on the limb, on the edge. And so he, here, that's not too bad a focus. Uh, and that's what I'm going to use to focus. And then you lock the focus and you can use that as soon as we went for the total phase, just take the filter off because there is no change that you have to make. The, uh, the um, image plane is exactly the same with the filter on or the filter off. So that's how you go about focusing. And you can do that with, um, with a telephoto lens as well. A lot of cameras now allow you on the screen to zoom in. And so you can zoom in on a filter uh, on a uh, on a sunspot rather and then focus using the fine focusing uh, ring on your uh, or focusing mount on your telescope uh, or obviously the focusing ring on your camera and then lock that down now you don't need uh, always need a filter and so i'm just going to show you some photographs and this is particularly if the sun is low in the sky that's not going to be the case for this eclipse for most of north america it's going to be quite high in the sky we'll talk about that in a little bit um, but if the sun is low in the sky you can actually shoot without a solar filter i'm going to show you this but also if there is cloud and there is bound to be cloud it's april it's going to be not a terribly advantageous month for weather through almost all of the eclipse path, except in Mexico, unfortunately, about 100 kilometers inside the Mexican border. We had talked for a long time about going into Mexico, but I just don't feel like taking uh, you know, a lot of uh, valuable equipment across the border and trying to get across the border on the morning of the eclipse. So we're gonna be watching from Texas. And unfortunately, as soon as you cross the border into the US, the weather prospects really diminish down to about 60% chance of clear skies in Texas, all the way up to somewhere in the neighborhood of 
45 to 50 percent on the south shore of Lake Erie, and then less as we go east uh, across uh, Lake Ontario and into eastern Canada. Um, so you, but you may be able to catch a glimpse of the part, at least the partially eclipsed sun through cloud, in which case you may not need a filter at all. So here is an example. Um, of a, a solar eclipse with a right near obviously uh, sunset in October of 2014. I shot this with a four um, a 400 millimeter lens. Uh, yes, 400 millimeter lens. And here you can see no filter whatsoever. Nice pictorial view. ISO um, one, uh, 100 with a 1 2000 second uh, exposure at f22. And so obviously you're going to be stopping way down and you're going to bracket your exposures and you may get something that is uh, fairly dramatic, something like this. Uh, another example. <clears throat> And this was a very early morning eclipse uh, in November of 2013 um, from uh, the um, north shore of Lake Ontario in uh, western Toronto, uh, right on the shore. And, and again, a uh, great dramatic cloud effect. And this was through my Explorer uh, six inch uh, telescope. Again, one ISO 100 and shot this time at one eight thousandth of a second because of course the telescope has a fixed focal uh, ratio and that is F8 in this photo. So you can do a lot of experimentation and come up with something that's pretty interesting. This was the annular solar eclipse um, of uh, three years ago, which was annular uh, over Hudson Bay, but it was a very interesting uh, early morning a sunrise a partial eclipse as seen from the north shore of Lake Ontario. And here again, same telescope. And I shot this using ISO 400 and you'll see the exposures there. So you can actually do some really interesting work without a solar filter at all. Now, this is what everybody wants, uh, wants and you're, you're not gonna be writing all of this down, but you can get it uh, afterwards in the, uh, in the replay on YouTube. Um, and it, the so-called proper exposure for various phases of the eclipse. There is no such thing. It's all a matter of personal perception and it depends on a lot of factors and I've listed uh, two or three of them here. And the last one at the bottom here of this um, screen, I think is really important. And you don't hear people talking about this very often, but it's something that I have noticed and determined and discovered over the decades that I've been doing this. Focal length, there's a psychological effect. If you have a very, very large, uh, large frame, uh, which is black, and then a very small, tiny little eclipse sun with some corona there, in order to make any kind of visual impression, you actually need to increase the exposure so that the corona expands outward from this black hole. Whereas if you're using a very long focal length and the black hole of the moon obscuring the sun is very large on the frame, you can easily uh, get a very dramatic photograph by having a much shorter exposure and you don't get nearly as much corona. There's a real psychological effect to this that I have seen. But again, what you're going to do is you're going to bracket your exposures um, significantly during the, uh, during the period of totality, remembering that this eclipse is about uh, two thirds longer than the great 20 August 2017 eclipse. So you got a little bit more time. Um, so this is courtesy of, uh, of Alan Dyer. And these exposures, I think, it's all very psychological and very subjective, but these exposures, I think, uh, are just about dead on for the, the, for the images that I like when I produce them myself. All right, and another one from the uh, great uh, astrophotographer Jerry uh, Lodrigus in the US, not quite as well known here in Canada, uh, very well known uh, deep sky astrophotographer, but also an eclipse astrophotographer. So look up his website and this information is all free. And this gives you the exposures that you will use, remembering that with a telescope, you've got a fixed focal ratio, F5.2, F8, F10, as the case may be. With a camera lens, you have an infinite variety from, say, f2.8 all the way up to f22 or even f32. And so you can choose your exposure, you can choose your ISO setting, you can choose your exposure, and you can choose your focal ratio or f-stop in order to get the appropriate combination that will produce the exposure that you like. Okay, what's really important if you don't have, if you're not using a telescope and you are using uh, just a, a, a camera with a telephoto lens, you got to have a strong, steady uh, uh, tripod. This is absolutely critical. More photographs are ruined by flimsy tripods than anything else. It's easy to buy a good camera, easy to buy a tele, you know, a nice telephoto lens, but what you really need to spend some money on is a tripod. This is the one I use. 
Uh, it's a Manfrotto. Um, I really like this one a lot. I know they're very expensive, uh, but uh, they're really fantastic. And I've been using this now for decades. And you see here a camera with a 200 millimeter lens with um, uh, a ball and a very, a very uh, heavy duty ball and socket head on the top that allows me to point the camera in any direction that I want. And so at this eclipse, this is going to be really important to appreciate. At this eclipse, the sun's going to be really quite high, even though it's only April. In Texas, where we plan to be, uh, it's going to be two-thirds of the way, more than two-thirds of the way from the horizon to the zenith. So that's going to have your camera pointing way up. Uh, even from Toronto, the um, uh, elevation is going to be at 45 degrees, almost exactly halfway from the horizon to the zenith. You have to think about that. You got to plan it. You got to set up your camera and your tripod ahead of time. Set it using a, an inclinometer that you can buy for about $15 from Canadian Tire. Set it for the for the actual elevation or altitude above the horizon, and then figure out: Are you going to be able to get down to your camera to be able to see, to be able to photograph, to be able to frame, to be able to focus. You got to practice ahead of time and think about all of these things. If you do, you'll get great photos. If you don't, you may not. Also consider using a right angle viewfinder as well for high elevation. And a lot of cameras now, of course, have tilting um, v, um, viewfinders or screens on the back of them. Uh, most of most mirrorless cameras uh, have that as well. The Nikon Z7 that I use has one. And those are really, really helpful because you can then focus looking down rather than trying to crane your neck and get under your tripod to look straight up. So these are really important things. Now, you can, Get some really interesting super wide angle stuff with 50 millimeter or 24 millimeter lens. Uh, er, uh, earlier, we were hearing um, uh, about um, uh, the location of various planets and so on. At, th at this eclipse, I can tell you, um, because the sun is going to be located in the constellation Pisces, um, there are not no bright stars in the region at all. As compared with 2017, the August 2017 eclipse, the first magnitude star Regulus was located just outside the sun's corona. It was a great opportunity, and I'm going to show you a photo of that a little bit later. We don't have that for this eclipse. However, we do have Mercury. Um, which unfortunately is going to be very faint, magnitude 4.8 at that time. We have, uh, and, and, and this is, by the way, horizon is seen from Toronto, so we're sort of you know looking straight up to the south. You're not going to see that corona because, of course, Toronto is outside the path of totality. But we see um, Venus there, magnitude minus 3.9, fairly bright, not nearly its brightest, but uh, still fairly bright. Uh, and then we get Neptune. No one's ever going to see that. And then the and then the brightest stars that are in the vicinity are all fourth magnitude. I don't think that there is a chance. Well, certainly no chance of seeing them, and probably no chance actually even of photographing them. Although I'm going to try. Now, this is the uh, is the framing that you could do with a full frame camera with a 35 millimeter lens. If you have something like that, you will be able to get Mercury and the Sun and Venus in the same frame. Now, I should also point out that the br uh, brilliant planet um, Jupiter that Arnold was talking about before is, is to the uh, outside the frame to the left, about the same distance away from the eclipse sun as Venus is to the right. All right, and so if you uh, you know if you want to use a 24 mil uh, a 24 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, you might possibly be able to get Jupiter, the eclipse sun, and Venus all in the same frame. Now, this is something that people don't often do. So let's just talk about that for a minute. Um, back in 2017, this is what we did. You can take binoculars and you can project the, um, the partially eclipsed uh, sun. It looks like a couple of eyes almost closed. And this is really fun and really interesting. In, in, in effect, the binoculars are kind of pinhole cameras in a way, but also you don't need binoculars. At this past October's eclipse, uh, when I was in Texas, I turned around and looked down and no one else was doing that because I knew what I was going to see. There were leaves on the trees. And this is what I saw, dozens of little eclipses through the leaves, which acted as little pinhole cameras. So there are things that you can see as well and do nice little pictorial views uh, to give a different impression and a different view of this, uh, of the eclipse coming up. But watch out for the technology. 
Uh, I do. I, I really do like this. You know, people talk. You know, setting all of this stuff up and then wasting the four minutes, thirty seconds of totality because their equipment doesn't work or their computer algorithms don't work. Uh, and and similarly, uh, similarly here, an eclipse is something to be enjoyed and wondered at. But I've also found, and a lot of a lot of people, very experienced people, don't do any photography at all because they just want to watch. I love later on in the years later looking at the photographs because it all brings it back to me you're going to have, have to decide yourself okay a few tips all right they, some of these are really obvious um, but you can't be doing it the morning of the eclipse and you can't be doing it during totality you know you'll mess it up remember that auto flash should be illegal <laughs> All right, manual settings. Do not use auto settings and disable the auto focus. You have to focus manually because your camera just will not be able to figure out how to focus on what it is seeing. All right, so these are just a few things that you can uh, that you can use. Let me then now go to the 2017 eclipse to, to give you an idea of what you can possibly get, particularly if you're using a telescope. And this is the uh, the first of the great American eclipses, as I think you remember, the first two, August 21 of 2017. It was an entirely North American total eclipse. I think probably the uh, most widely observed uh, total solar eclipse ever in history to that point in time, although this one is clearly going to be well more uh, well observed, more people traveling, partly because it's through the eastern U.S. Uh, and partly because it's now seven years later. And uh, so this was a trip that I took with my uh, my family over five days. Uh, as you can see here, the our, our main observing site was going to be in Grand Island, Nebraska. The morning of the eclipse, uh, about two in the morning, I took a look at the weather forecast. It didn't seem to be, uh, it seemed to be a little doubtful for Grand Island. So we um, put all our gear in our car and on eclipse morning, we drove over 500 kilometers to Western Nebraska. Some of you have seen these photographs before. Um, and it was foggy uh, the entire way, but just as we got to Scott's Bluff in Western uh, Nebraska, it cleared up, the sun uh, burned off the fog, and uh, we got the clearest of the uh, total solar eclipses that I have seen, uh, starting in 1972 and all the way through to 2017. So here's my gear set up for this eclipse. Uh, it was, a, it was uh, just a, a tremendous time. And what I'm going to show you here then is what you can get with a decent telescope, pretty good telescope, but uh, you don't have to have one a telescope that's that big, uh, using a good solar filter. And so here we see uh, sunspots with the advancing limb of the moon. You can actually see with careful focus mountains on the edge on the advancing limb of the moon. And so this was through the solar filter. And you'll see then the focal length and the ISO that I was shooting at. I generally like to use somewhere in around 200. Uh, for an eclipse, I can go down to 100, but I like to use 200. Um, and then uh, you'll see what the exposures are, but you're going to be bracketing them. Now, one of the things I'm going to suggest is this. You got to do a bunch of practices. And what I always do is I take photos of the uneclipsed sun an hour or so before, before the eclipse, and I test out different exposures. And what you want to get is an exposure that actually does show the sunspots, but actually shows a little bit of dimming as you get to the edge or the limb of the moon, because that's then, if you get that, then you're not overexposing. Because the sun is, and not surprisingly, I think we all know, um, visually dimmer at the edge because the light has to go through more of sun atmosphere and, and all of those things. And so you really should try to practice that. And that then will give you what you consider to be the right exposure and will also allow you to get the sunspots rather than having the sunspots burned in and really invisible in your photos. So I think that that's really important. So we get here the diamond ring both before and after uh, with prominences, as you can see. And so this, and obviously, of course, no filter. So this will give you an idea of what I was shooting at. Here for this, for the diamond ring, ISO 200 and 132 hundredth of a second. So these are short exposures that uh, are required in order to get the a diamond ring, um, also appropriately to shoot the uh, prominences. And you can get some, some very, very inner corona using this kind of exposure as well. And then this is this is my favorite photo, you know, obviously sort of full Corona um, and, you know, processing it properly. You really get the brushes and the detail in the Corona. And so that is the exposure straight up 
ISO 200 and 1 80th of a second. Now, use shutter delay mode. Lock your uh, lock your mirror if you're using a DSLR. Lock your mirror up if you're using a, um, a mirrorless camera. You don't have to worry about that. But what you're trying to do is eliminate or minimize vibration. And if you're concerned about your mount, and for example, if it's windy and your mount's blowing around a little bit, then increase the ISO even up to 1,000 so that you can then increase the sensitivity and then shoot a much a, a much faster shutter speed of one two thousandth of a second, for example, so that you will eliminate any vibration. Camera sensors now are so good that even at high ISO settings, you're not going to get pixelation or graininess. They really are very good. So that's just a little bit of a, of a tip there. This was what I, I wanted to tell you about. That is Regulus in the um, in the upper left, and I really I really wanted to photograph uh, this one. Uh, and and again, I just moved the telescope off uh, off center to be able to uh, shoot this slightly longer exposure because I didn't know how the long exposure I would need actually to get Regulus, but I was able to get that, and you don't see that very often at solar eclipses. And then finally, this is one of my one of my favorites. Uh, of prominence is just uh, toward the um, at, at the end of the eclipse and here shooting much faster because I didn't want to get um, if, if you if you shoot at a slower shutter speed then you're going to completely burn in the prominences and you won't get them at all and I can tell you that is not fake coloring at all that is what they look like that's the color you look at these prominences visually that's what you see and the camera can really reproduce quite well exactly what you're going to see visually so it's pretty impressive uh, when you see something like that this is something you don't see very often i decided that i would try to shoot a very very long exposure well fairly long exposure during the clips to see whether there was any way i could get earth shine uh, and of course, what you're seeing there in the white is the completely burned in corona around the eclipsed uh, sun. And actually, I was able to get um, Earthshine at its brightest. Obviously, Earthshine is at its brightest um, at new moon, but you can't see it because the sun's in the way and blocking everything out. And so this then was again shot at ISO 200, but I shot it at uh, one and two thirds seconds at F8, and that's what I was able to get. I'm going to try that again this time. Um, I saw, I think it was Dennis Tachico who did something like this decades ago. I haven't seen one since, but I decided to try this in 2017. And then uh, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, you know, if we often hear, and, and, and of course, you got to be careful. Uh, you know, you have to be careful with your eyes. There's no doubt about it. I always take my solar filter off between 20 and 30 seconds before the start of totality. Uh, always. And uh, this one actually happens to be at, after the end of totality, but it was 35, 39 seconds after the end of totality. By that time, the trailing edge of the moon's shadow was approximately between 20 and 25 kilometers to the east of us, uh, having passed over to the east of us in Nebraska. In this photograph, you can see, yeah, the brilliant uh, emerging uh, crescent of the sun you can still see corona and you can still see prominences uh, and you can photograph them using a focal length like this you might be able to get something like this with a 500 millimeter lens as well the point i want to make is this at this coming eclipse for people in toronto as we know the path of totality crosses lake ontario and just the northern limit just misses toronto but it just misses the islands of toronto by only about five or six kilometers from the Ontario Science Center, the northern edge of the northern limit is 13 kilometers away. If I was able to shoot this into clear sky from Nebraska with the shadow 20 kilometers away, you will be able to get this using a, a long focal length, either telescope uh, or, or camera lens from the Science Center, uh, let alone from parks on, you know, much closer to the edge, um, uh, to, the, to the waterfront. So you will, even if you can't travel, there's a very good chance that you can do this. I've never heard anybody talk about this, and generally astronomers don't talk about actually doing photography of the corona uh, outside the actual limits of, of totality itself. But you can do it. You've got to be careful. Sure. But remember also, for eye safety, your eye starts to deteriorate when you start, when you gaze at the sun in a fixed position, 
for about 30 seconds. It takes about that long for the infrared light to actually do damage to your eyes. Every day we look up at the sun, we glance up at the sun, and no one says, oh my God, you're going to go blind. It takes some period of time to do that. I'm not suggesting to be careless. Be very careful. But what I'm telling you is that I have been doing this for decades and you know i'm i'm looking up at the sun i'm looking through the telescope i'm looking right through the telescope and on the camera um you know at the at this time uh, and this is what i'm seeing and this is what i'm able to photograph so i just want to uh, to point that out to you uh, there are various things that you can do and do it very safely this by the way was uh, 20 seconds after the end of totality and this is going to be very similar to the view that you would get here in toronto the shadow actually happened to be to the east. And so you're here in Toronto, you're going to be to the north of the shadow, but it's the distance from the edge of the shadow that really matters. Uh, and so I just, I actually just produced this one, uh, processed this uh, this afternoon when I was thinking, how about, you know, showing them what it might actually look like from Toronto through a telescope. There you go. And uh, so this was a uh, one happy family at the end of our trip in uh, Western Nebraska. Um, I'm, I'm finally going to just say one thing. This was supposed to be about lunar eclipses as well, but I was talking to Paul Markoff and he said, Michael, you don't have enough time. And I think he was right, but we do have a lunar eclipse coming up. It's a penumbral lunar eclipse. And most people yawn and say, oh, well, there's, you know, it's not worthwhile. And as Arnold was saying, it's three in the morning. I understand that. However, you can still photograph a penumbral eclipse and it's not nothing. So what, and, and this uh, penumbral eclipse happens to be visible over all of North America, as you can see here. And the uh, and, uh, almost the entirety, about 96% of the moon will be in the penumbra of Earth's shadow. The southerly portion uh, will, be, um, will be the darkest. And what I want to show you is the, um, the penumbral phase of uh of a total lunar eclipse a photograph taken of, of of that some time ago and so this was in april 2014. so this was before the partial phase even started and this is a photograph of the moon in in immersed completely in uh in, in the penumbra um and uh of earth's shadow and so you actually can see a noticeable difference and a gradient from one side the side of the moon that is you know that is furthest away from earth's shadow uh to the part that is all you know that is almost touching the umbral part of the shadow and so please do not be deterred and don't think oh i'm never going to be able to photograph or even see anything you absolutely can and i think that this is just really really interesting so give that a try and um what i will say then uh is simply this you know um people say and i think it's really true a total eclipse of the sun is the most spectacular of all natural phenomena that it is possible for a human being to witness and uh, this is going to be my 10th in addition to annular and beaded annular eclipses there are a lot of members of the society who've seen more uh, many more than i have ralph Chu of the toronto center the world's leading eclipse eye safety expert uh, is one of them but uh, this is what we're always uh, looking for and i'm going to finish up there this is just from the 2017 eclipse a little collage uh, and what i'm going to remind us all of is that's the length of time until the next one so thank you very much i hope that that presentation will be of some use to you and of some interest and i'm going to stop sharing my screen right now so there we go and again thank you as always for uh, inviting me it's a pleasure to be your national president after 54 years of membership in the RESC. there we go thanks paul Thank you very much, Michael. Fabulous presentation, very informative, and thanks so much for presenting to us. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Why don't we get started here in the room? Why am I not seeing any hands? What's going on? <laughs> it's because they knew it all. All of this is they knew already. <laughs> here was the first question. So speaking of filters and totality, uh, in theory, you don't even need one, right? If you just image the totality. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, that's completely true. Not, not only do you not need one, you can't use one because the, the corona is sort of, you know, one ten thousandth the brightness of the sun. And so you keep a, a, a filter, a solar filter on during a totality, you'll get nothing and you won't see anything. You have to take it off. And how do I properly time it to make sure I don't burn the sensor? Like, you know, when do I 
Well, that's what I was trying to talk about. I was giving you an example of me photographing with no filter 39 seconds after the end of totality. And as I say, what, what I always do is I always take off the filter between 20 and 30 seconds before totality actually starts and leave it on for that length of time after totality ends. Now, most experienced astronomers aren't gutsy enough to do that. And so they'll maybe do it for five seconds just to get the diamond ring, and then they'll put the, the filter right on. But I I have determined that you know, over numerous eclipses over decades, you can actually keep it on for longer, and uh, you're not going to you're not going to burn the uh, you're not going to damage your sensor. All right, thank you. Okay, I see a question over here. Hang on a second, Michael, while I walk over with a microphone. Sure. Uh, hey, how's it going? That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, so Very well. I'm going to be taking um, <clears throat> a group of students ranging in age from 4 to 18 uh, to see the eclipse at Six Nations. It's going to be wicked. But if you were making a speech about eye safety to that group of kids, what might you say? What I would say is this, and this is actually a very interesting question, because in, in 1984, we went to Papua New Guinea to see a 53-second eclipse for a very specific reason. Um, and there were kids there, and, and as you might imagine, um, there was not necessarily a lot of scientific understanding and no equipment and so on. And of course, uh, they have been told, you know, it's you know dangerous and all of that. And, and we had our kids, we, we had the kids out the day before because we were camping there the, the day before, you know, with eclipse glasses, you know, that, that they put on. And we talked to them about it and said that it's perfectly safe if you put these on. Um, there is, and, and, what, and what I have said is this, there is this, um, um, this completely unjustified feeling that, some, that during a, a solar eclipse, for some reason, the, the earth is bathed in some kind of special lethal radiation that, is, that, that, that occurs only during a solar eclipse. Well, that's nonsense. It's no different than just watching the sun at any other time. And, you know, we, and, you know when we go out on a sunny day, we, you know, we don't hear on the news every morning, it's going to be sunny today. Use your solar filters. Don't look up at the sun. Of course, we don't hear that. Why? Because the sun is so bright that we're prompted to look away as soon as we look up. We see it, oh yeah, it's sunny, and then we look away. Um, way before there's any danger of, of any, you know, of any eye damage at all. The reason that people talk about it during an eclipse is that people go to extraordinary and often stupid lengths to try to filter the sun so that they can see it for an extended period of time. And if you don't use the right solar filter, then the infrared light will come right through. For example, using in the old days exposed and processed black and white film that just allows the infrared to come straight through, even though the brightness level seems to be perfectly fine, so you can look at it, uh, you know, and smoked glass and all of that kind of you know stuff from years gone past. So that's what I would say. Yes, you have to be careful, but don't think that this is super dangerous. It's just not. Um, and so that's the way I, I would put it. I think we. I think that we, you know, especially with, you know, with younger people, we need to have them uh, careful, but we don't want to panic them and because it's not necessary. It really is not necessary. Now, I think you want to have, you know, a sort of, you know, one adult for at least 10 kids or something like that, you know, because you got to make sure that people, you know, and, and young kids don't necessarily know what they're doing. They're going to be kibitzing. Um, they may have tears. They, they, they may be poking around and put a tear in their in their glasses. You got to be careful about stuff like that. So supervision is important, but, but fear mongering is not. And I think it does a disservice to scientific understanding. That's my vote, my view. Thank you. Any more questions for Michael? Well, while people think about it, I have a question myself, Michael. Sure. I've never seen a total solar eclipse, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm wondering, how dark does it get? Oh, and that's thinking, such a good question. I'm thinking, is it like nautical twilight, civil twilight, astronomical twilight? What do you think? Um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to answer that in a couple of ways. But the first is, it really depends on the particular eclipse. And what I mean by that in particular is this. If you have an eclipse of with, where totality is of short duration, the basic reason for that is that the moon is further away 
than, than an eclipse of long duration. For example, the great 1983 eclipse across Africa, which was a seven minute eclipse. The, the, the moon was, it was almost at perigee and much larger than, um, uh, than the sun. And the consequence of that is that the width of the shadow as of the umbral shadow as it fell on Earth was a lot wider than it's going to be at this eclipse. So at this eclipse, for example, in Texas, it's going to be about 180 kilometers wide. Um, and so and 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 that's that's fairly wide. Uh, and the point is that when you look down during the total phase of the eclipse, if you look around at the horizon, you will see sunset colors, sort of orange color, colors all the way around because you're looking at the part out of the sky, outside of the shadow all around you. For a long eclipse, that's going to be a much wider shadow and the light from the horizon is going to be much less. And so it really depends on the eclipse. I expect that this eclipse is going to be somewhat darker than the August 2017 eclipse because it's longer by about two thirds and therefore the shadow is going to be wider. Um, and what I would say is that it doesn't get as dark as you as as you might think. I would say that the darkest is probably as dark as it gets during a fully moonlit night, a full moon. Um, I just don't have any trouble, you know, seeing stuff, doing my settings and all of that kind of stuff. Now, you know, you look up and you see this. It's just unbelievable. This black hole in the sky and, and the black hole of the moon actually seems to be darker than the surrounding sky. Um, so that's what I would liken it to. You will have no trouble, uh, you know, you know, finding, um, you know, something that you're looking for, picking up your binoculars or anything like that. But it does get dark. You won't notice it getting dark. And this is another really interesting phenomenon until only a very few minutes before the total phase starts. And why is that? Even though the moon is, is uh, has about an hour and a half, an hour, 20 minutes, when it's gradually crossing the, um, the sun and thereby obviously diminishing the light level sort of arithmetically to 50% and 25%, what happens? Uh, your your eyes open up, right? Iris in your eye opens up and because it's trying to compensate for the lower light level. And only when your eye is fully open and the light continues to diminish, will you then perceive that the light is actually diminishing. And so you don't actually notice it until about 10 minutes before totality, which is a really interesting phenomenon. I've never actually heard described, but I figured it out myself from what I have observed. So but I, I answered a little more than you asked. Great information. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have some more questions in the room. Actually, this is a comment on how dark it gets because mm -hmm. I saw the eclipse from Tennessee and we were oh, in the okay. park and there was a park shelter. So I thought, you know, looking outside at the field in the open area, it looked like it wasn't getting that dark. But then I realized, and this was like maybe 15 or 20 minutes, looking under the shelter, my heavens, it's pitch black under there. Uh -huh. Wait a minute, there's something funny going on. Uh -huh. I, I, I take it you got a clear sky? Yes, we did. Oh, well, good for you. I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that because, of course, the weather prospects for eastern North America were not as good as for the West. And yet from people I've heard who were, you know, in, in those areas, Illinois, for example, as well, Carbondale, which is sort of Eclipse Central, um, you know, it actually turned out to be good. So uh, so good for you. I'm delighted that, to hear that you saw it. Thanks. Oh, next person. Hey, Michael, great chat. Uh, yeah, now you talk, we were talking about the light difference. Now, what about noticeable temperature difference? Um, yeah, that happens as well. Although I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm so wrapped up and so excited that I just want to pee um, that I don't notice that. I, I just don't. And so, for example, you know, at the at the um, October eclipse uh, of, that I drove down to, to to Texas for a quick trip down to see that it was 13 degrees, but it was just on a T-shirt. Um, and so, yes, you 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 do notice that for sure, uh, and you will notice uh, if there are birds around. You will notice that they they do they do go into the trees and they and they go to roost, um, and so you uh, you do notice that. But I don't think that it it tends to be as significant an effect as people sometimes talk about. Okay, thank you, Michael. Any more questions in the room? Yes, we have one more. Mm -hmm. I'm walking over with a mic, hang on. Here we go. Uh, how realistic is it to try imaging 12P Comet during the totality? 
uh, sorry, uh, imaging what? I just missed uh, that. Twelve P Pons Brooks. Oh, 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 um, uh, that's uh, that's going. That's really that's really hard to say. Um, it um, and actually maybe should uh, ask Arnold because he was talking about this. I don't know what the projected magnitude is going to be. Um, and so there is a. I think that there's probably a decent a decent chance with an appropriately an appropriate focal length um, uh, lens of getting um, of of getting the head of the comet the coma. Um, but how how much tail you would get if there is you know decent tail showing there, um, I just I just don't know. Um, but I think that what you want to do for sure um is is really bracket like crazy uh so that you use you know that you use long exposures um uh and that and and you may completely burn in uh the solar corona but that gives you your best chance and so i would say it'll probably it'll probably sort of you know at eight or even ten uh exposures from one that will get the corona and then you know that will expand expand it expand it and so on fortunately you're going to have enough time to do that because um well in most of the us the eclipse is long the total phase of the eclipse on the center line is longer than four minutes uh here in toronto it's about uh, three minutes 40 seconds i think something like that um but of course uh, or in or, or in niagara so you are going to have time if that's what you want to try thank you okay we have one question here hi you mentioned you went to a bunch of eclipses and around the community around it uh with, with their setup uh sorry with your setup how do people do people like approach you a lot asking you about uh, a lot about the questions or is like you find there's enough time to just talk with people about everything happening as throughout the event so that's a really good question and and i guess what i will say uh, is this depending on where you are obviously uh an eclipse can be a great social event um and Obviously, I've done this a lot. I've seen a lot of eclipses. I've been a member of the society for over half a century. Um, and and it's a great pleasure to be able to go and talk to people. And you saw a photo of my setup. You hardly ever see setups like that at eclipses. So you can imagine that everybody wants to take a look. What are you doing and all of that? And it's a great opportunity to talk to people as well. I, I always try to take um, my, my main mount with my telescopes and then a, another mount with a smaller telescope just to let people look at it. And so they just line up and, and they look through another telescope. And that's why I drive to these things. Um, and so it can be, uh, you know, it, it, can, it can be a really good social event um, and also an educational event. But what you got to be really careful of with your equipment is you have to tell people to stay back and organize them so that they stay, you know, so that they stay in, in a line. And if you're experienced enough, then you can do your photographs and then talk to them and do your photographs and talk to them. And then I say, starting five minutes before totality, I'm not talking to anybody. I got to concentrate or I'm going to mess it up. Um, and you just tell people that and they do understand, uh, you know, people are just fascinated. If they're traveling a distance to come to see this thing, they're interested in, in it and they will uh, respect your equipment, the information you give to them and the courtesy that you extend to them as well, which I think is really important as ambassadors of the largest national astronomical organization in the world, which is what we are. Great. We have uh, an online question. All right, thanks. Um, uh, at little Dave says, "What? When should we remove sun protection glass?" I'm res I'm assuming that the filter. Well, I, I think I've sort of tried to answer this at least twice before during this talk. Like I said, I take off my the filters off my uh, off my telescopes. So the same thing applies then to a camera lens or or visual uh, or binoculars, for example. Uh, 20 to 30 seconds before totality and then put the filters back on 20 to 30 seconds afterwards. Now, I'm able to do that because I have a lot of experience and I know what it's like during that period of time. If this is your first eclipse, then I wouldn't do that. I would take the, um, the filter off 10 seconds before totality. That way, at least, then you'll look up, for example, in binoculars or through a telescope, uh, and you'll see the diamond ring and the corona. You'll see all of that. 
Um, and but uh, which you won't if you don't take your filter off a few seconds before totality. So don't worry at all about taking it off 10 seconds before. Do not worry at all about that and keeping your filter off for at least 10 seconds afterwards. I do it longer, but that's just me. There was also another question about uh, uh, good locations and because everyone's going to have questions about that. Where would be a good website to go for uh, the map of good locations for uh, viewing? Uh, all right. Um, the way I would uh, put it is this. I So I have, um, and the people who are going to be with me, have three general observing locations on the and, and this may sound like it's not answer the question but it's going to be uh on the friday before the eclipse friday the 5th we we're going to drive from toronto to st louis 1200 kilometers we we're going to stay overnight there overnight we are going to look at the uh, at astro astrospheric a uh, astronomer's um, cloud forecaster and we are going to decide that we are going to stay there in the so-called quad state area and then observe from missouri or our illinois or we're going to retreat back up to Cleveland because the south shore of Lake Erie has for Canada and the U.S. probably the second best chance, believe it or not, of actually a clear sky. Or we're going to get up um, at four in the morning and leave and drive to Texas. We actually hope that we get to Texas. And I've got, um, I think, six specific observing sites set up, which I have viewed, which I have um, figured six of them there. Uh, another half dozen in, in Illinois and Missouri, and then I think five or six on the social, uh, surrounding Cleveland, using a combination of Google Maps and Eclipse Prediction software, which shows exactly where the center line is going to be. And what are you looking for? You're looking for parks, right? That's the first thing that you are that you're looking for. And there are a lot of municipalities that have parks. You don't know, and we just don't know what it's going to be like. You're going to have to get there really, really early because the roads may be jammed. Um, Michigan, for the last year, has been just terrified about what's going to happen. Uh, in, uh, in Texas, they are expecting somewhere between one and one and a half million people to come into the state for this. It will be by far the most widely observed eclipse. The interstates are going to be completely jammed. And what you want to do, if at all possible, is the night before the eclipse, you want to be situated inside the path, inside the path of totality, in case the roads are just completely jammed by eclipse goers. Now, fortunately, by the time it gets here to Toronto, it's going to be about three o'clock in the afternoon. And so what you want to do, if you're heading down to Niagara, you better leave at 6 a.m. And, and get into the path, get to a park, get to a place where you can go to the bathroom during the day and set yourself up there. Uh, take a cooler and all of that kind of stuff. But you want to get there early because Niagara is going to be, to use an astronomical expression, nutso. All right. Why don't we uh, stop there? And all right. we'll thank Michael once again. Great having you. You're very welcome. And, and, and listen, I'll simply say for all of you uh, who are going to be traveling to see the eclipse, good luck. And uh, I hope we get clear skies for everybody. Thank okay? you. you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.